Yep. Um, we're starting off just talking about um, rocks and minerals. Um, and then the next part of the lecture is talking about some of the key concepts we covered in the course. And the final part is bringing it all together into magma chamber processes, volcanological processes, and finally linking all that back to tectonic setting. Um, all right, so we'll go through some of the key minerals we covered through the course, uh, except we're doing them all together at once now. Um, starting with olivine, um, very dear to my heart, I managed to find a better picture of a more typical looking olivine on the bottom there. So olivine is a major, major part of mantle peridotites. It's found in primitive melts. So these are the kind of first melts that come out of the mantle before they've had a chance to differentiate much. Um, so these would be either tholeitic, alkali basalts, or basaltic andesite. And, and you will usually get olivine the, uh, being the first <coughs> crystallizing mineral from a mantle melt in any tectonic setting. Uh, they're also found in mafic and ultramafic cumulates. We covered uh, stuff like dunites and troctolites in the oceanic crust, and uh, dunites, hartsburgites, gabbros, all sorts of stuff in mafic intrusions. Um, we usually report the composition as the forsterite content or the Mg number, and it's basically just the molar uh, magnesium divided by the molar magnesium plus ion times by 100 to make a percentage. Um, if olivine is crystallizing and, and being fractionated, that is being removed from the melt, then uh, it reduces the MgO, the nickel, and the magnesium number in the melt. Um, I'm not going to go over the optical, um, the, you know, the microscope characteristics of the minerals. If you want those, it's in the, in the uh, original lecture notes. Okay, orthoperoxene, um, very similar to olivine, but it's got more silicon compared to magnesium and iron. Um, it's also found in mantle peridotites, um, in mafic and ultramafic cumulates. This is mainly in uh, layered intrusions, uh, places like Bushveld, there's, there's lots of orthoperoxene. Uh, and the reason for that is because you get lots of orthoperoxene crystallizing in crustally contaminated ultramafic lava because it's got higher silica. So if you can get the silica up through uh, crustal contamination um, and still have plenty of magnesium and iron around, you can get orthoperoxene. Um, it's also found in arc lavas, but in arc lavas it tends to be a bit later crystallizing. So um, basaltic andesites to dacites, you'll have orthoproxene crystallizing after plagioclase and clinoproxene. Whereas in these kind of crustally contaminated ultramafics, it crystallizes mm -hmm. after olivine and before plagioclase. It's got two end members. One is encetite, that's the magnesium end member, and the other one is ferrocylite, which is the iron end member. And if we have orthoproxene crystallizing early in these kind of crossly contaminated magmas, then that's happening by peritactic reaction with olivine. And we'll come back to that in the next uh, part of the lecture. Um, clinoproxene is, uh, is still pyroxene, so basically the same formula, but one of the magnesiums and ions can substitute for calcium. And we'll have varying amounts of calcium depending uh, on, on where we find the clinoproxene. So in mantle peridotites, it's usually diopside. And we're reporting the clinoproxene composition on this pyroxene tetrahedron. Orthoproxenes are all at the bottom. They have very low calcium. This is the calcium corner. This is the encetite or the magnesium rich corner. This is the ferrocylite. So orthoproxenes all down here. Um, in mantle rocks, it tends to be diopside, which is as much calcium as you can fit before it stops being a pyroxene. And in basalts, it tends to be orgite, which is a little bit lower in calcium. Um, you find it in all sorts of primitive melts, um, tholeitic basalts, alkali basalts, basaltic andesites, um, in pretty much any tectonic setting. Um, it's also common in mafic and ultramafic cumulates. Um, and clinoproxene is quite high in calcium. So when it crystallizes and is removed from a melt, then it reduces the calcium concentration in the melt. Um, plagioclase uh, is a sodium calcium feldspar. It's found in uh, almost all lavas. Um, it's pretty much there right from the start of crystallization to the end. Um, it's also in almost all intrusive rocks. So you find it in ultramafic cumulates like troctolite. You find it in mafic cumulates like gabbros. And it's uh, a key constituent of granites. Um, it's also found in the shallow mantle, but only depths below about 20 kilometers. Um, if we fractionate plagioclase from a melt, uh, it reduces aluminium. Uh, it also reduces strontium, which swaps in for calcium. 
and then uh, europium 2 plus, which you might remember from the rare earth element patterns and the europium anomalies. Because um, it's feldspar, it's reported on this uh, anothite albite orthoclase diagram. So calcium N member is anothite, sodium N member is albite, and the potassium N member is either orthoclase or microcline. Um, and in general, uh, plagioclase compositions go from being anothite rich in mafic melt, and as the temperature uh, drops and as the melt uh, becomes more and more evolved, it goes more and more to sodium rich compositions. Um, alkali feldspar is basically only found in felsic melt, so uh, rhyolites, granites, you can also find it in, in dacites, and the kind of equivalent of that is a, is a granodiorite. Um, and we talked about how the structure and, and properties of this depend on the temperature, and whether or not we lock in the high temperature form or the low temperature form depends on the cooling rate. If it's very, very fast cooling, um, so in a volcanic rock, then the high temperature form, which is sanidine, will kind of get frozen in. Um, if it cools more slowly, uh, say in a granite, then the structure can actually keep reorganizing itself as the temperature drops to make either orthoclase or microcline. And they look quite different in, uh, in thin section, but the chemistry is more or less the same. Uh, next we have amphibole. Uh, this is one of our hydrous minerals. You find it in arc lavas, uh, generally andesite or, or more evolved, so andesite to rhyolite, but it's not always there. It's not a key component of andesite. Something can still be an andesite if it's got no uh, amphibole. Did you have a question over there, Emma? Oh, sorry, I thought you had your hand up, yeah. Um, we also find it in granites. Um, granites are hydrous because they're, they're usually formed by dehydration melting, so we have a little bit of water to make amphibole. Um, the two types of amphibole that we talked about are hornblende. Uh, this is the one in the top right. Um, you can see it's kind of brownish in, in color in, in this rock. And hornblende is an aluminum uh, bearing amphibole. Um, it's got a big, long, messy formula that we're not going to worry too much about. Um, in arc lavas, it usually comes out brown. In I-type granites, it's, it's kind of a green color. But the key thing is it's not that blue-green to sometimes purple that the alkali amphiboles can be. Um, it's also found in, in metamorphic rocks, and I've just highlighted that because it becomes important in terms of uh, forming granite later. Um, alkali amphiboles, we, we met briefly in the last uh, lecture and exercise, and those are uh, things like rebekite and ofbedsonite, off and they're found in A-type granites. Um, biotite is a, uh, it's a magnesium and iron bearing um, mica. So, it's a hydrous mineral. It's almost always in uh, evolved or kind of felsic melts. So you find it in some arc lavas, uh, dacite to rhyolite compositions, and then granites. Again, the water is coming from dehydration melting. It's usually brown in arc magmas uh, and in S-type granites, but it can be uh, quite green in I-type granites. Um, it's also common in sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. And it, again, that's important because this is one of the main ways that we get uh, dehydration melting to, to make granite is by breakdown of biotite. Um, muscovite, we, we just covered briefly in the, in the granites lecture because it's found in S-type granites. Um, it's very high in aluminium. You can see instead of having uh, magnesium and iron in the formula, it's got another couple of aluminiums. Um, and you also find it in highly evolved leucogranites. These are the most felsic, most, uh, most evolved type of granite. Um, in S-type granites, is often found with other high aluminium phases, including garnet, cordurite, and aluminosilicates. And I haven't made individual slides for these because they're, they're not as important for you to learn, but just bear that in mind. And again, this one's common in metamorphic rocks and dehydration and melt, melting of muscovite is what usually forms our first little bit of, of melt as, as things get to very, very high metamorphic grades. Um, titanite is one of the key minerals for identifying I-type granites. Um, you can also find it in metamorphic rocks. Um, and it's got that kind of... Uh, kind of wedge shape. It's a, it's a weird um, mineral, it's a calcium titanium silicate. Um, and I think this is the last one, it's uh, just opaques and oxides. And, and often in the practicals, we didn't, we didn't divide these up too much and, and they're quite hard to recognize from thin sections. So, so don't worry too much about that. But the key thing, um, we talked about uh, 
chromite, uh, which forms in mafic and ultramafic melts, and we talked a little bit about uh, chromatite formation. Um, chromites are really, really rich in chromium, as it kind of says in the name. So if we have chromite fractiona fractionation early, that causes the chromium content of a melt to fall with differentiation. Um, the other important kind of group are these uh, iron titanium oxides, and these can be a range of things. It can be titanium magnetite, uh, just plain old magnetite, and ilmenite. And these are formed in um, a wide range of melts, and you pretty much see them in every tectonic setting. Uh, you also can see them in, in certain granites. The thing that's important um, about these is once iron titanium oxides uh, begin to fractionate, it causes iron in melts to fall, and it's the timing of this iron titanium oxide saturation that divides tholeitic versus calcalkaline series. So in a tholeitic magma, there's uh, quite a lot of crystallization before iron titanium oxide saturate, and so the iron goes up initially, and then it drops after uh, the oxides start to crystallize. In a calcalkaline series, um, the iron titanium oxides are crystallizing from the start, so iron is always dropping. Um, and then ilmenite is, is characteristic of S-type granite. And I didn't talk much about identification outside the practicals, but just to, just to give you a quick overview, chromites are often these pretty small kind of equine, they look cubic, uh, square, tetrahedra, uh, rhombuses sometimes. Iron titanium oxides can be these kind of wacky shapes, and, and when you look at them um, under, in terms of composition, they're often made up of these different chunks of magnetite and ilmenite, so that it was one grain to begin with, and then they split as it cooled. And ilmenite makes these uh, needles. Uh, I think this one's actually from Agabro, but you also find them in S-type granites. Oh yeah, this is the last one. Um, Nephilim and other feldspathoids. Um, I don't expect you to learn too much about these, except to know that these are characteristic of silica undersaturated alkaline melts. So alkali basalts and all the kind of uh, things that crystallize from those. They are similar to feldspar, but they have a lower ratio of silica to alkali metals. So we've got the comparison here. Nepheline, you can see there's uh, four sodiums for every four silica. So we have kind of uh, one sodium or, or potassium to every silica. And if you can compare that to albite, you only have one sodium for every three silica. So in these alkali basalts, we have much higher alkalis. We generally have lower silica, and that's what's causing us to, to crystallize these feldspathoids. Um, both of these pictures are, are for nepheline. OK. Um, everyone happy with that? OK, just a whistle-stop tour of minerals. Um, next, we'll just cover some of the rock types that we talked about during the course. and. I've kind of split it into to chemical classifications and then we'll do some textural ones because some of these are defined by the, the type of minerals and the composition they have and others are, are more to do with uh, how they erupted or, or how you see them in um, the samples themselves. So, uh, Firstly, mantle pridotite. Um, it's an ultramafic metamorphic rock. Uh, it's got a lot of olivine, um, orthoproxene, clinoproxene, and a small amount of a, an aluminous mineral. This uh, aluminous mineral changes with, with depth and pressure. So below about 20 kilometers, it's plagioclase. Between uh, 20 to 70 kilometers, it's this magnesium aluminum spinel. And above 70 kilometers, it is uh, garnet. And the, the type of garnet is, is called pyrope because it's got a lot of uh, magnesium in it. So up in the top right, you can see a picture of a spinel prototype and on the uh, next to it, a, a garnet prototype. And we talked about how when the mantle melts, it starts off as a, what we'll call a fertile lurzolite. Fertile just meaning that it's, it's ready to melt, it's, it's easy to melt. Um, and as you melt it and remove basalt, then the composition uh, increasingly moves towards Hartsbergite. And if you can get to either really extreme degrees of melting or there's some sort of melt rock reaction where a, uh, a mantle melt is passing up through mantle above it and reacting with it, then you can make a dunite. Um, we talked about a range of uh, mafic and ultramafic cumulates uh, during the course. So most of these are going to be found in uh, mafic intrusions or in uh, oceanic crust, in the lower part of oceanic crust. Um, and these are basically different combinations of olivine, pyroxene, and, and plagioclase. So we have dunite, which is basically pure olivine, usually with a bit of chromite. Uh, troctolite is olivine plus plagioclase, and you'll see that in some ophiolites in 
um, oceanic crust. We have whirlites, which are olivine and clinoproxene. Um, gabbro, up in the top right here, um, which is plagioclase, clinoproxene, and olivine. And if it's finer grained than this, say if it's in a, in a dike, then it usually gets referred to as dolerite, but there's no compositional difference between dolerite and gabbro. Um, we have norite, which is uh, defined by plagioclase plus orthoproxene. Sometimes it has a bit of olivine as well. And lastly, chromatite, um, which we talked about in, when we were talking about the Bushveld intrusion. Um, and that's a pure chromite rock, or, or very, very high proportion of chromite. Um, for the felsic intrusive rocks, we classify them on this QAPF diagram. Uh, most of the rocks that you'll, you'll ever see are up in the, the top side of this between quartz, uh, alkali feldspar, and plagioclase. Um, all of the granitoids that we talked about fit into this diagram. So uh, we define granitoids as being quartz, plagioclase, and alkali feldspar with about 20 to 60% quartz. So it's in this field up here. Um, granodiorites are essentially the intrusive version of a dacite uh, composition wise uh, granites are more or less the intrusive version of a, a rhyolite in terms of composition um, diorites which uh, got less than 20% quartz are actually down here um, diorites are, are, are basically the intrusive version of an andesite um, if we have an alkaline rock um, and it's crystallizing feldspathoids, then the, the intrusive versions of these would, would be in this lower part of the diagram. So between alkali feldspar, plagioclase feldspar, and feldspathoids like nepheline. And just a reminder that you can't have quartz and feldspathoids crystallizing at the same time because you need to be silica oversaturated to crystallize quartz and you need to be silica undersaturated to crystallize nepheline. So there's just no composition where you can be doing both. Um, next up is granite classification. Um, we have our alphabet classification, which is split into I-type, S-type, and A-type. Um, I-type is supposedly something with an igneous protolith. Uh, this has a low alumina saturation index. The alumina saturation index is the molar aluminium divided by sodium plus potassium plus calcium. And uh, why this is interpreted as being an igneous protolith is because um, you ha it hasn't been through a weathering cycle. So when we weather stuff from the continents and make sedimentary rocks from it, then the aluminium tends to get concentrated into clays, whereas the sodium, potassium, and calcium tend to remain in um, in solution in the in the water or whatever that's that's doing the weathering so then when we take that sediment and we melt it it has more aluminium um, than these other elements whereas for an eye type that's an igneous protolith it's basically come straight out of the mantle it's never been weathered and redeposited when we melt that it doesn't have this aluminium enrichment so eye type has a low asi it has uh, minerals like pyroxene um, hornblende biotite and we also talked about titanite um, and magnetite being fairly key uh, features. They're very common in subduction zones. Um, large proportion of the, of the granites that you see in subduction zones are I-type. Um, S-type is a sedimentary pro protolith. This is because it has been through a weathering cycle. So it's had that aluminum enrichment from the formation of clays and all the sodium, pot uh, potassium, and calcium gets removed during weathering and, and stays in solution. Um, so high alumina saturation index, um, which means that we get a lot of these kind of aluminium rich minerals like muscovite, cordurite, um, andalusite is just a type of aluminosilicate, and finally garnet. Uh, these are the most common type in continental collisions, such as what we see at the Himalayas. Uh, finally, we've got A type, which is not defined based on the protolith, it's defined based on the tectonic setting, which is one of the weaknesses of this classification. Um, so A type is anorogenic. Um, these are usually peralkaline, which means that just the sodium and potassium is higher than the aluminium. And so that means that we can crystallize all these weird um, al uh, alkali-rich minerals like uh, the alkali pyroxenes, adrene, and alkali amphiboles like rebekite and arfvedsonite. Um, yeah, and so those are the characteristic minerals for each granite type. Um, for lavas, we 
uh, classify them on a task plot, which is a total um, total alkali versus silica. So total alkalis is just sodium plus potassium. Uh, silica is self-explanatory. Um, and for both the tholeitic or the calc alkaline series, we're, we're below this this line and this curve. So the, the subalkaline magma series, which just means that they're, they're not alkaline magmas. Um, and here we have our, our kind of standard magma evolution from basalt to basaltic andesite to andesite to dacite and eventually to rhyolite. Um, alkali magmas are above this curve. They have lots of sodium and potassium compared to silicon. Um, and this is usually because of uh, lower degrees of melting. And these evolve at, um, once, you're, once you're either side of this line, it kind of changes the, the trajectory of the, of the magma differentiation. So the further you are on this line, the, m the more you evolve towards high alkali compositions at relatively low silica. Whereas on this side, you're kind of evolving in that direction. So they basically um, move apart. And that's because of the thermal divide that we talked about in, uh, in basalt crystallization, where if you, if you have a small degree melt that's uh, formed very deep, then you get an alkali basalt and it crystallizes away from feldspar towards uh, nepheline and other feldspar feldspathoids. Um, if you are the other side, uh, if you have a high degree melt or it's relatively shallow, then you get a tholeitic composition and it crystallizes away from feldspar towards quartz. So they're, they're flowing down either side of the same hill. Um, in terms of distinguishing calc alkaline from tholeitic magmas, uh, these are distinguished on an AFM plot. Uh, A is just alkalis again, sodium plus potassium. F is iron and M is MgO. Um, here you can see what we were talking about with the iron titanium oxides, that in the calc alkaline series, um, they're more oxidized because of fluids coming off the slab. And we can, uh, even from a basalt, we're crystallizing uh, iron titanium oxide and the iron is dropping as the magnesium drops and the alkalis go up with differentiation. For a tholeitic magma series, um, we're not as oxidized, so we don't start off crystallizing iron titanium oxides. We begin moving away from M, magnesium, because we're crystallizing olivine, clinoproxene, that kind of thing. And the iron actually goes up to a peak, at which point the iron titanium oxide starts to crystallize, and then it drops. So this is the kind of fundamental distinction between tholeitic and calc alkaline series. OK, um, this is just a bit of a summary of the, the different types of mineral assemblages you'll see in, in each one of these rocks. So in a basalt, it's often going to be olivine, uh, plagioclase, clinoproxene, and then maybe with some iron titanium oxides or chromite. Um, Andesites are uh, quite plagioclase rich. You will often get clinoproxene, orthoproxene. You may have a bit of olivine, um, and you may or may not have hornblend. And then there'll also be iron titanium oxides. Um, for dacites or rhyolites, you'll get plagioclase, uh, quartz. You may have clinoproxene, you may have orthoproxene, you may have hornblend, you may have biotite, and you may have alkali feldspar. Um, but you shouldn't see olivine. Um, these are these are two evolved to crystallize olivine, and by this point, most of it should have should have dropped out. Um, yeah, and here's just some pictures where you can see the different assemblages. So, big olivine crystals in a basalt here, with um, some plagioclase, and in between the plagioclase we have clinoproxenes. So this one crystallized olivine, then plagioclase, then clinoproxene last. Uh, top right we have an andesite that is basically just made of uh, plagioclase and um, amphibole with a few small opaque oxides. And then in the bottom right, we have a rhyolite that has quartz, plagioclase, alkali feldspar, uh, <laughs> some biotite, which are these brown minerals, and probably some ilmenite, these needle shaped opaque minerals. Okay, um, last part of, of this lecture. Um, is rock types, but this is more where we're classifying things based on, on shape, texture, field occurrence, that kind of thing. So the first and, and most obvious distinction is between intrusive and extrusive rocks. Um, in general, intrusive rocks are going to be coarse-grained because they're slow cooling. 
Um, this means that the crystals have lots of time to grow and um, it's never going to freeze to a glass because there's enough time for it to keep crystallizing and keep crystallizing and keep crystallizing at high temperature. You don't tend to get fine grain ground mass either. So generally things are going to be uh, kind of granular. Most of the minerals should be more or less the same size and there's no obvious phenocryst ground mass distinction. Um, extrusive rocks will often be porphyritic, um, which means they've got phenocrysts uh, in a ground mass. That ground mass can sometimes be glassy. If it cools quickly enough, it can freeze to a glass before that liquid has a chance to, to crystallize all the minerals that, that it should be crystallizing. They're often vesicular because we have um, bubbles nucleating uh, as the uh, magma depressurizes and some of those will get trapped in the, in the lava. And we'll often see textures indicative of eruption. And this varies depending on the eruption style that we'll get into. But in this example here, which is a pillow basalt, we have a chilled rind with these radial vesicles. So the, the, especially the glassy rind, you can only get that if it's very cool, very fast cooling around the edges. And then of course the vesicles tell us that it's depressurized um, a fair bit. All right. Um, this slide's just about the different types of magma chambers and intrusions that you get. So intrusions or intrusive rocks are these uh, frozen igneous remnants of magma chambers or conduits. Um, some of the types we talked about in the course, uh, layered mafic intrusions. And so in these layered mafic intrusions, you, you have some sort of large magma chamber. It's convecting. We have all these kind of magma chamber processes going on. Um, Plutons, by contrast, um, even though Pluton is, is technically a shape description, they, they usually end up being felsic. So these are usually some sort of granitoid. And they're these, these diapirs, these kind of rising blobs um, of dome-shaped uh, granitoid magma, uh, probably with some crystals that are being carried up, and then the rest of it crystallizes in place. Um, and then lastly, we've got dikes, which are vertical sheets. These are usually, uh, usually conduits bringing magma upwards and sills, which are horizontal uh, sheet-like intrusions. So these might be intrusions that get spread out between layers of sedimentary rock or, or lava flows or something like that. On the top, we just got a diagram of, of convection that's going on in a mafic magma chamber. And below, this is a, a granitic pluton in Yosemite. Um, when it comes to describing cumulates, um, cumulates consist of cumulus grains, which is kind of like the intrusive version of a phenocryst. These are the big crystals that uh, make up kind of a framework in, in the rock. Um, and in between those, we have a variable amount of intercumulus material. Um, and this represents liquid that got trapped in between the crystals and then crystallized in place. Um, we can broadly classify cumulate rocks based on the proportion of cumulus and intercumulus minerals. So uh, if there's lots of intercumulus, it's an orthocumulate. And then with less, uh, it becomes a mesocumulate. And with virtually no um, intercumulus material, it's called an adcumulate. Um, for... Uh, these, these are kind of rocks that are like leftover lava flows, but we're, we're classifying them based on the, on the texture, not necessarily composition, although it is related to the composition. So for the kind of low viscosity, more basaltic styles, we'll get pillow basalt if it's erupted uh, under deep water. We might get pahoyhoy lava flows if it's erupted on land. Um, if the lava is slightly more viscous, we'll get an aa flow. And the big difference between the Pahoyhoy and the R is that Pahoyhoy has that solid crust um, that as it tears, it's able to repair. It sort of gets deformed as it flows into these, these ropes and lobes, and we have these thin branching flows. The R is more viscous, and so the, the, the flow and the crust is kind of tumbling over itself, and it's unable to repair a surface. So instead of being smooth like this one, it's very, very spiky, absolutely full of uh, bubbles and vesicles. Um, as we get to even more uh, viscous lavas, then you get these blocky flows, which have very steep sides. They're quite thick, and they basically are covered in this in this this rubble of angular blocks. And finally, at the really high viscosity end, we get lava domes, and these are basically not able to flow up, flow very far, so they're just gradually filling up as more lava is extruded. Um, 
the sides of the domes can collapse down, giving these talus slopes, which look a little bit like the edges of these blocky lava flows, but they're just not flowing as far. Yeah? No, it's just that if you have lots of um, if you have lots of vesicles in a highly viscous magma, then it will tend to erupt explosively. So basically, if your magma has time to degas uh, near the surface, or perhaps it's already degassed from a previous eruption, then it may not have enough volatiles to erupt explosively, and you might form something like a like a dome. But if it's still carrying lots and lots of volatiles then it will never get to the stage of being a dome. It will erupt explosively. Right. Um, for explosive eruptions, um, we produce uh, volcanic clasts. And um, these are broadly um, divided into magmatic clasts. These are clasts that are formed during the eruption that erupted them. And we have non-magmatic clasts, which are bits of bits of rock that erupted that had already formed um, before that eruption. Um, so those non-magmatic classes, important to note, they could be, um, they could be older um, erupted, uh, older um, material from previous eruptions or, or from the, the vents, uh, the sides of the vent, the wall rock. Um, or they can be kind of what you call country rock. They could be chunks of sedimentary rocks or whatever that have been shot out of the volcano because they were part of the vent sides. Um, the divided by size, so we have bombs if they're magmatic, more than 64 millimeters diameter, or blocks if they're non-magmatic. Um, both magmatic and non-magmatic are called lapilli if they're between two and 64 millimeters diameter, or ash if they're less than two millimeters. So we just got some pictures up here, ash, um, lapilli, and then a bomb in the bottom right. And um, you can see here, I've divided the lapilli into pumice. This is kind of the, the felsic um, version. This is kind of highly, highly vesicular uh, felsic magma. And then uh, scoria is the more mafic version. And it's also highly vesicular, but it tends to be a little bit denser because the walls are a bit thicker. Um, it's, not quite, uh, it's not quite stretched out as much, and there's a bigger proportion of rock to, to bubbles. And that's just because bubbles can escape more easily through the mafic magma because it's a bit more... Uh, a bit less viscous. Um, in general, the more explosive the eruption, the smaller fragments we get at, uh, we end up with. So volcanic ash needs a fairly explosive eruption to make it happen, whereas bombs can be spat out from something like a Strombolian eruption. Um, in terms of uh, deposits from these types of explosive eruptions, we have uh, tufts and then a subset of those which are ignimbrites. Um, tufts are defined as having more than 75% volcanic ash. We can also have these mixed tufaceous sediments where you have a mix of uh, kind of normal plastic sedimentary rocks and uh, tuff mixed into it. Um, there's three main types. Uh, you can have fallout deposits. These are just rained out gradually from a volcanic cloud. They tend to be very well sorted, uh, quite fine grained. We have ash flow deposits, which are uh, ignimbrites or, or, or welded tufts. Um, and then we have reworked tufts, which is where a tuff is deposited and then some other sed sedimentary process uh, picks it up and redeposits it elsewhere. Um, the reason I said that uh, ash flow deposits are ignimbrites or welded tufts is that um, ignimbrites uh, are formed by pyroclastic flows where the temperature is very high and we need temperatures above 600 degrees C to weld the ash together. This just literally just means it's... Uh, is deforming and, and getting stuck together. So um, for ignimbrites, we have four main components. We've got the ash. We'll often but not always have phenocrysts. Uh, we'll have juvenile class, and these could either be uh, fiamme if the, um, if the ignimbrite was deposited while it was still very hot and flowing, and these fiamme can get squashed by the weight of sediment above them. And they can also get stretched out by the flow itself. So sometimes you can get fiamme that are very, very long in one direction. Um, and finally, there'll be lithic class or fragments. As you can see from the two ignimbrites up top, we have a very, very large variation in the amount of lithic uh, fragments. So on the right, there's this kind of brownish ignimbrite, and all these black spots are uh, lithic class from a previous ignimbrite eruption. Um, on the left here, it's uh, this pale ignimbrite, and there's just a few little chunks of, of sedimentary rock in there. 
Um, tufts can be all sorts of weird colors. So there's a green one over there. And under the microscope, you can sometimes still see these little remnants of, of the bubbles that were ripped apart um, in the explosive eruption to make ash. That's all I got for rocks and minerals. So um, we'll take a short break. Um, start back at five past two.